I want to start off by saying, uh, as Molefi did, uh, my name is Maulana <laughs> in Davizita. My name is Maulana in Davizita, Karenga. And those three names indicate my three commitments in the context of my commitment to our people and to creating a just and good world we all want and deserve to live in. And to honor our ancestor assignment, which says this is our duty, to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. Maulana means master teacher, the name my organization gave me. I'm dedicated to teaching and to learning because I can't teach without a constant learning. So the development of a life of the mind and to root that in my own culture. In Davizita means constant concern to the enemy. That means. <laughs> the first name, the first name is Swahili. The second name is Zulu, and the last name is Kikuyu. Zulu in Davizita means that you know I'm a constant soldier. As the Odu said, a constant soldier is never unready, not even once. That's right. Karenga <laughs> means keeper of the tradition in Gikuyu. Yes. Culture is my life. Yes. I believe that, you know, that's the fundamental way we are human in the world. Yes. And I, I um, started out like that, arguing for culture as a fundamental grounding, the hub and hinge on which the whole of human life turns is how people engage their own culture. Whether they're strong, whether they have agency, whether they're self-determining, depends upon how they engage their culture. And by culture, I mean the totality of thought and practice. And you have to get, you have to get rid of, that's why when Molevi said he wrote my book, I said, he's written the only real book on me. The rest is trash and an addendum. <laughs> Listen, the rest is trash and an addendum to FBI files. <laughs> and that's the best it is. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my ideas. And that is why I appreciate what uh, James has said. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what Michael has said. I appreciate James Conyers and his um, moderation here and what he's written. And certainly, I appreciate Molefi yeah. for taking the time to write yeah. the first and only serious treatment of my work, my intellectual work. In fact, the book is called Maulana in Intellectual Poetry. And he, he said it's an unfinished work. We know we have to extend it. I'd like to extend it myself, but you know, I don't want to be too self congratulatory. <laughs> I'm going to turn that into autobiography. <laughs> I'm going to turn that into autobiography. And, and so, but, but I, need, I need to tell this story because other people are lying on me. Yeah. And they pretend I'm who I'm not. My philosophy, I root my life in my philosophy, Kawita. Kawita is an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange That's with right. the world. That's right. Ongoing synthesis, right? Of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. I ground myself, as Du Bois said, start with your own history, and then both through that, understand the whole of human history. But if you skip over yourself, who are you? That means that I'm also a culture nationalist. And so you can get that straight. Let me tell you what that means to me. <laughs> culture nationalism is thought and practice organized around Three fundamental propositions. The first is that the defining feature of any people or nation is its culture. Second, that for a people to be itself and free itself, it must be self-conscious, self-determining, and rooted in its own culture. And the third principle is that the quality of life of a people and the success of its liberation struggle depends upon it waging cultural revolution within and political revolution without 
resulting in the radical transformation of self, society, and hopefully and ultimately the world. Now the transformation of self is key. People don't That's want right. to deal with that. That's right. But whether we talk Malcolm, That's right. which I'm writing a book on called <laughs> The Liberation That's Ethics right. of Malcolm X, mm -hmm. I think it's very important in, 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 in the subtitles, come um critical scientific uh, uh -huh. The liberation ethics of Malcolm X, critical consciousness, moral grounding, and transformative struggle. Okay, and that comes from his his title said our program is wake up, clean up, and stand up. That's right. Wake up is critical conscious, coming in critical consciousness. Mm -hmm. Clean up is moral grounding, and stand up is transformative struggle, which is both internal and external. Okay. So you know, this is how I see life. So what happens here is that when we talk about transforming ourselves, that means making ourselves competent in the world-encompassing project that we as African people are involved in. We are world historical people. We're not just ghetto people. We don't, as this is one of the most, one of the most damaging things, and I like, see, People don't want to argue with me, but I want to argue with them. What is, what is, what is, what is, is that right, so that I mean, I try to get people up. No, but you know that. You know that's true. Right? One, one of the things, one of the most damaging things that has happened, is for people to get so involved in uh, in, in popular culture and pretend it has a greater content than it does, yeah. and making things revolutionary that in anybody else's time or place or culture, it would seem like child's play and folly. So we have to stop lying to ourselves, you know, about what we're in. We never pretended. Look, it's just like, it's just like uh, St. Couture had to tell his artists in the lecture. First, let me do Paul Robinson so you don't think I just skipped over to the continent. <laughs> Paul Robinson said the battle, he said this to the writers, the artists, all these people want to step outside the struggle. He said the battlefront is everywhere, there's no shelter to read. And Toure told the people, if you want to make the revolution, I mean, if you want to write a revolutionary song, make the revolution. You know, work with the people, struggle with the people, and the song will come of itself. That's right. Right? So you can't just make one, oh, this is it. Please. That's right. That's right. Make revolution. Okay, so. This, this thing that I'm doing, it's, it's, called, it's a culture retrieve, a kind of intellectual archaeology to go back and bring forth the best of our history and culture. But people say they're African, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not just talking about where you came from, geography. White people live in Africa. Well, that's what I'm <laughs> not talking about your color just about. I mean, that's one criteria I'm going to use, but they're dog white people, right? The fundamental and defining feature of a people is its culture. And so what we have to ask ourselves is how do we live our culture and make our culture a living tradition? And that means Sankofa. We used to say that. You know, we have different fads sometimes. You used to wear Kente cloth. Remember that? <laughs> Yeah, you just had symbolic association yeah. with the culture. Yeah. Not a deep embrace of the culture. Yeah. I embrace the culture, you know? Yeah. I, the first thing I ever do, whenever I see anything, and whenever I get in a conversation or people invite me to do a paper, or there's a paper to be given, I ask, what is the African way of understanding this, yeah. of engaging this? Right. So when Molevi talks That's about it. you're asking a question, he doesn't mean if you come oh. from a sociological feel inside black studies, you can't ask a sociological right. question, right. but it has to be from an Afrocentric right. vantage point. Right. It has to be from yourself. Right. Why do something off in the sky? Do you realize ideas don't drop from the sky, they don't grow from the ground, they don't float in from the sea? They come from the culture in which you find yourself. And if you're in a dominant culture that's hegemonic, and that it defines life, and you accept that, that's a problem. We say in Kau Eden that one of the greatest powers in the world is the power to define reality and make others accept it even when it's to their disadvantage. Yeah. And often that happens in the academy. Yeah. I argued with a white woman, Dean. Mm -hmm. For 10 years I struggled for a black 
a women's studies uh, 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 position. Yeah. And Maulana, why you need that? We got women's studies. I said, no, you don't have women's studies. You got white women's studies. <laughs> What's the difference in black women's studies and white women's studies? I said, in black, in black women's studies, in black studies, right? It's a field in black studies. It's not separate. It's a field in black That's studies. Right. I said, in black study, black women, let me do white women. In white women's study, <laughs> black, black women are a topic. I don't care how much time you talk about, it's essentially a topic. In black study, black women are the subject. That's a long way from just being talked about in an episodic and periodic way. So I told her also, if you really want more evidence, tell me what are the intellectual texts you borrow from to teach the subject. That's right. Where did the idea come from since I just don't drop from the sky? Who are your heroines? Mm -hmm. Who are your models, your paradigmatic people? I don't mean trotting in, ain't our woman conversation, <laughs> misnaming, misnaming the lecture. If you really are serious about the lecture and you have the victorious yes. consciousness of my brother and friend uh, Molepi talks about, you don't name that ain't our woman like I'm asking you to accept that. This is toward a redefinition of womanhood. That's, right. That's intellectual. We've got to think ideas. And one of the things we don't talk enough about is ideas. Sometimes we talk about problems, but we don't, we don't put them in an ideal form. So we need di di what we call deep thinking. It's an Egyptian word, jair. It came from a medical field. And it means a kind of an insistent probing and a deep probing that is looking for discovery, diagnosis, prognosis, and prescription. So that's what the kind of thinking we need to do when we do it. And Malcolm said it at a lecture at Harvard. He said, the, liber <clears throat> the logic of the press cannot be the logic of the press if they want liberation. So we have to have a liberational thought. We have to have an emancipatory thought and an emancipatory uh, practice. That means I see uh, Africana studies in three basic ways that we've talked about. And some of this is uh, standard, cultural grounding, academic excellence, and um, social responsibility. Now, you can't have black studies without cultural grounding. For a long time, we just had academic excellence and uh, social responsibility. But in what context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got to be in a culture context, but to believe, like Du Bois said, that African culture is worthy of the most considerate and analytical study. It's, it has to be, if we don't think that, what else do we think? So what happens, though, is that we move from that to do the most <clears throat> respectable, the most serious, deep thinking, the most excellent research and intellectual production that even when our enemies, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk that, even when our opposition <laughs> disagrees with our contention, they still concede the rigor of our analysis right. and our intellectual production. That's what they have to do. So, so what we have to do is that then we go to social responsibility. That means being an activist intellectual. Ben right. McLeod Bethune said knowledge is a prime need of the hour, but people want to know what you're going to do with your knowledge. Right. And she said, it is up to us to discover the dawn and then share it with the masses and our children who need it most. And I believe that, and it's a teaching as old as our uh, uh, text and as old as our thinking. This morning we, in our classical African philosophy panel, I was saying how the ancient Egyptians conceived the human beings as Reiki. That's the name they, when they say human right. being, they say Reiki, right. means wise and knowing being, right? That tells us not only how important knowledge is to what constitutes being human, it also tells us what we need in order to fully realize our humanity. Hmm. That is, as Garvey said, coming to the fullness of ourselves. Hmm. A person don't know what's happening, hmm. don't know what's possible, hmm. can't even achieve it. Hmm. We used to say in us all the time, you know, until we break the monopoly that the oppressor has on so many of our mind, liberation is not only impossible, it's unthinkable. Because what you can't and what you can't conceive, you can't achieve. If you don't even know it can be done, how can you do it? Can't stumble onto this. 
So I, I just want to close and say, I think one of the things I think, I hope I have brought to uh, black studies is not only, and I, and I like, and this is one thing to show you with me and Molevi, I like black studies as our title. And I'm ready to change it as we change. And I always told NCBS, you know, you, like Molevi said, take authority. Comrades. That's right. Yeah, rule on something. Self determination. You know what I mean? That's right. That's this amazing. is my brother. This is what I'm talking about. You know? if, we're, if we're the preeminent organization, I mean, does anybody challenge that? I mean, we're the preeminent organization. Why can't we give out some kind of resolution or statement? But anyhow, because you know why it is, Valerie? Because people keep saying that 50 different ways to do things. But if you had a legal society and a political science society, right, and a historical society, they come up with resolutions. Now, somebody try to get out of there. We don't do what they do. We don't do what white people do. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you just choose what you do that white people do. So I'm, I'm just saying that we need to we, we, we need to take. Let me tell you about what I said about that. The reason I I changed. We changed our name at Long Beach, Cal State University Long Beach, into African Studies. I told the people, I argued against it, but you know the masses sometimes, if you don't concede you something, you, you have <laughs> mutiny in your yeah, ranks. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to concede. <laughs> science fiction film. That's so listen to <laughs> So I said, and they think you're just being too, you're too dominant. So yeah, I, sometimes I have to go along. But I told them, and I even wrote up, the, the plan to send to the chancellor's office to get it. I mean, I know the arguments. I've heard the arguments so much, and I try to clean them up as much as I can. But I like I like black I like black studies. You know why? Same reason I like the natural. See? <laughs> you know why? You, you know why? It's a sign of struggle. We can never disassociate black study from the struggle that brought it into being. That's right. And even though we are Pan-Africanists, right. and even though our view is global, yeah. we have to have our foundation among African Americans. If we lose that, we don't have black studies. We got something else. We already got African studies. We already got right. Caribbean studies. When I say African, I mean continental African. Continental African studies. We got Caribbean studies. What else studies do we want? Canadian black studies. We got all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we are African people. And just like Zimbabwe studies itself and got a national history, I'm out of time. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>